Hey folks, Bill Armstrong here. Um, we're going to finish off the graphing of the six trig functions. I'm going to do a quick overview of that. And uh, thought I'd start off with uh, the tangent and cotangent. Uh, so far we've seen the basic graphs of sine and cosine. So here's the basic graph of tangent x. Um, notice the, the general shape that the basic graph of, of tangent x has. Uh, it has a vertical asymptote at negative pi over 2 and a vertical asymptote at pi over 2. Now this is just the basic graph over one period. So remember the, uh, what, what period tells you is that this basic graph would re be repeated. It's going to constantly be repeated if we sketch the graph over, over more uh, uh, periods. Uh, so the period is from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. So let's make a note of that. If the period's from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, that means the period is pi. So if you wanted to graph this over two periods, you'd make another vertical asymptote out here at 3 pi over 2, and then sketch the, the, the shape that you see here. But when you hear tangent x, when you just hear you know, the function tangent x and its basic graph, this is what I'd like to pop into your head, that it has a, a left vertical asymptote at negative pi over 2 and a right vertical asymptote at pi over 2, and it has this always increasing uh, type behavior. Over here is the basic graph of cotangent x. Um, it has a, a left vertical asymptote, what's well, at the y-axis, so that's uh, x equals 0, and then it has a right vertical asymptote at uh, pi. And it has this type of a shape to it. It's always a, a basic graph has an always decreasing behavior. This is the graph over one period. So from 0 to pi, that means the period for cotangent is the same as the period for tangent. Make a note here. It has a period of pi. Remember, period is what you need to see the shape of. Uh, you know, the smallest interval to see the shape to know what the graph looks like everywhere. So this behavior is just repeated, you know, forever and ever. But uh, when you hear cotangent x, have this picture pop into your head. So that's the basic graphs of uh, tangent and cotangent. Uh, the next thing that I'll look at is, you know, what happens if we do a, uh, what happens if we do like a, a change to the period? just like what we saw in sine and cosine, like a horizontal stretching or a horizontal compressing. So we'll look at that here, the, the next order of business. All right, hey, if you're asked to graph a, a function of the form y equals tangent bx or y equals cotangent P, bx, um, just like with sine and cosine, one of the first things to do is to determine what the period is for the graph. So for either one of these, to determine the period, we take pi divided by b. That's it. I'm going to do a quick example here of graphing um, a tangent function over one period, and then I'm going to move on to uh, the cosecant and secant graphs. So here's a quick example. Let's say you're asked to graph y equals tangent 2x. And let's say you're asked to graph that just over one period. Okay, the first thing I'd do, folks, is I would determine what is the period of this graph? What's the period of this function? So, as I've written right here, the period is simply pi divided by b. Well, b has a value of 2, so for this function, the period is pi over 2. So now we know the period is pi over 2. Folks, completely analogous to when we did the sine and cosine graphs. With sine and cosine, uh, you remember I talked about the five key points, and I talked about the left end point of one interval, or of one period, and the right end point of one period. Completely analogous to that, I'm going to find the left vertical asymptote and the right vertical asymptote
for one period so I can sketch this graph. So it's completely analogous to the left endpoint and right endpoint, except here they're vertical asymptotes. So to get the leftmost vertical asymptote, which I will abbreviate as LVA, left vertical asymptote, and again, this is going to seem completely analogous to what we did with the sine and cosine. I'm going to take this junk here, this 2x, and I'm going to set it equal to negative pi over 2. Now, why am I setting it equal to negative pi over 2? Go back to the basic graph of tangent. Uh, the first thing I had up here, the basic graph of tangent, just tangent x. It has a left vertical asymptote at negative pi over 2. So that's why I'm taking this junk and setting it equal to negative pi over 2. And then if I, uh, you know, multiply both sides of this equation by 1 half, I get x is negative pi over 4 as the leftmost vertical asymptote for the graph of y equals tangent 2x. So then how do I get the rightmost vertical asymptote? Well, just like what we did with sine and cosine, you have two ways of doing it. Take this 2x and set it equal to pi over 2. Why pi over 2? Because the basic graph of tangent has a rightmost vertical asymptote at pi over 2. Or you could take what you just found, the leftmost vertical asymptote, and add to it the period. Either way, it doesn't matter. You're going to get the same result. You're going to get the rightmost vertical asymptote is pi over 4. So now to sketch this graph, I just come over here and I say, all right, x-axis, y-axis. Here's the leftmost vertical asymptote, negative pi over 4. Here's the rightmost vertical asymptote, pi over 4. Notice the distance from negative pi over 4 to pi over 4 is pi over 2. That's the period. And now I just sketch the characteristic uh, you know, tangent graph. So I sketch in something that looks like that. And that's it. That's, uh, that's the graph of tangent 2x over one period. And that's all I would really be looking for. Have those, have those asymptotes. Find those asymptotes, label those asymptotes, and you're good to go. All right, hey, next up I thought we would uh, look at the basic graph of cosecant x. And actually, you know, when I hear cosecant x and I'm thinking about graphing cosecant x, I immediately think of sine. I think of sine because I know cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. So what I've, what I've sketched here so far is the graph of sine x. So this is uh, the characteristic sine wave. And if I know the graph of sine x, I can always get the graph, the basic graph of cosecant x, because I know cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. In other words, if I looked at points, any points um, on this graph of sine x, any of these points, you know, has a, has a y-coordinate. The reciprocal of that y-coordinate would match up with what cosecant x. So, you know, here's a point. It looks like it has a y-coordinate of about two-thirds. The reciprocal is three-halves. That would give me a point up here that would be on the graph of cosecant x. Likewise, cosecant x, the point would be up here. Here's a point that uh, on the graph of sine, it looks like it has a y-coordinate of about one-fourth. On the graph of cosecant, the reciprocal of one-fourth is four, so it would be up there. And, you know, what that will allow me to do is, let me do this with this uh, pinkish colored chalk, is uh, get the basic graph of cosecant. It's going to look something like this. First, note, wherever my graph of sine has an x-intercept, that's where my graph of cosecant will have a vertical asymptote. So let me sketch in the vertical asymptotes. By reciprocating the, uh, 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 the, the y-coordinates of these points, and I could plot all up, 
points in here for cosecant, I would get one piece of the graph of cosecant that looks like this. And likewise, the other piece would be down here, and it would look like that. So these two pieces together, those two pieces form the basic graph of cosecant x over one period. And the period is the same as the period of sine. It's uh, 2x. So when we're going to graph cosecant, I'm going to show you, and, and, and I think your book does as well, I'm going to stress, let's use the graph of sine as our guide. All right, hey, let's look at the basic graph of secant x. Just like with cosecant, uh, with, with cosecant, I'm thinking graph of sine. For secant, I'm thinking cosine. And that's because of our reciprocal identity. Secant is the reciprocal of cosine. So what I sketched here is the basic graph of cosine. And uh, just like what you would do with um, uh, the cosecant, we employ the reciprocal identities. And, you know, to kind of cut to the chase, let me use this blue chalk. You know, wherever my graph, wherever my graph of cosine has an x-intercept, that's where the graph of secant will have a vertical asymptote. So it looks like I'm going to have a vertical asymptote, uh, what, pi over 2 at 3 pi over 2 and also at 5 pi over 2. Okay. I could look at the basic graph of cosine extended to the left, to this x-intercept, uh, which is negative pi over 2, and put my vertical asymptote there. You know, it, it doesn't matter. I just need to see two branches of the graph. And, and what I mean by two branches is I need to see, that's one branch of the graph of secant. And remember, I get that from taking reciprocals of those y-coordinates using the reciprocal identity, and there's another branch. So I either pair these two pieces together, and I call that the graph of secant x, or I would pair this branch and this branch together, and call that the graph of secant x. I don't care. You want to put these two together and call that the basic graph of secant x? Awesome. You want to put these two together and call that the graph of secant x? Awesome. What is important is that you, you know, I can see or you can see what the vertical asymptotes are. In any event, there is your basic graph of secant x. So to recap with cosecant and secant, whenever you're asked to graph a cosecant or secant function, the first thing you should do is graph sine or cosine and use that as a guide to get the graph of the cosecant or secant. I'm going to do an example here in a, in a moment to show you uh, uh, what I mean by that. All right, here we are. Um, say we're graphing over one period y equals 2 cosecant 3x minus pi over 4. So when I'm asked to graph this, this cosecant function, actually the first thing I do is I'm going to graph its related sine function. I'm going to use that as my guide to get this graph. So that means I am going to graph over one period y equals 2 sine 3x minus pi over 4. Because we know how to graph that. We know I mean, this is a pretty friendly one to do. We, we've already um, uh, spent some time graphing uh, sine functions that have a different amplitude, a different period, and a phase shift. So let's go through the process. We already know how to do this. We know that this has an amplitude of 2. We know it has a period of 2 pi over b. b is 3, so 2 pi over 3. We know 
To get the left end point of one period, we take uh, the junk we see inside parentheses, set it equal to zero, now solve for x. So I'd add pi over four to both sides, multiply both sides by one third. So I have the left end point of one period is pi over 12. Right end point of one period. Remember the right end point of one period, I can take uh, uh, the mess I see in parentheses and set it equal to two pi and solve for x. That gives me the right end point. Or I can take the left end point and just add one period to it. Doesn't matter, I'll get the same thing. So let me take the left, or let me take the uh, junk inside parentheses, set it equal to 2 pi and solve. You could check my work by taking the left end point and adding one period to it, just to make sure we get the same thing. So I'll add pi over 4 to both sides, so 2 pi plus pi over 4, that's 8 pi over 4 plus pi over 4, that's 9 pi over 4. And I'll multiply both sides by 1 third is going to give me uh, See, 9 pi over 4 times 1 third, that gives me an x equals, what is that, 3 pi over 4? Okay, did you check me on that? Pi over 12 plus 2 pi over 3, that's a pi over 12 plus 8 pi over 12. That would give me 9 pi over 12. 9 pi over 12, that does reduce to 3 pi over 4. So, old stuff. I'm just, just doing old stuff we already know. I now know the left end point and right end point of one period. So you remember how we graph that. Once you know the left end point and the right end point, lay off one period on the x-axis. So the left end point is pi over 12. The right end point is 3 pi over 4. At, uh, an amplitude of 2, so let me get some scaling in on my y-axis now. And then remember, once you know the left end point and right end point, you find the other three important points, the other three key points, the other three quarter points. So remember, the first one I always find is uh, the midpoint. And remember, to get the midpoint, all I'm doing is just going to add those together and take half of that. So pi over 12 plus 3 pi over 4... See, that's uh, 9 pi over 12, add those together, that's 10 pi over 12. Half of 10 pi over 12, that's 5 pi over 12. Then to get this first quarter point, I add these two together, and then take half of that. It's an old process, we know this. Pi over 12 plus 5 pi over 12, that's 6 pi over 12. Uh, half of 6 pi over 12 is 3 pi over 12, which that reduces to pi over 4. To get this uh, third quarter point, just add these two together and take half of that. So 5 pi over 12 plus 9 pi over 12, oh good grief, that's 14 pi over 12. Half of 14 pi over 12 is 7 pi over 12. So those are my key points. I'm trying to graph this to use as my guide for that function. So just keep in mind everything we know. I would put pi over 12 in here for x. See what comes out for y. And I believe 0 would come out for y. I put uh, pi over 4 in here for x. See what comes out for y. And I believe 2 would come out for y. Likewise, put 5 pi over 12 in for x, and 7 pi over 12, and 3 pi over 4. And I get this as the graph of 2 sine 3x minus pi over 4. And this is my guide for the graph of cosecant. Once I know the graph of the sine, it's very, very easy for me to get the graph of this cosecant. The graph of the cosecant, I mean, look, x-intercepts for the graph of sine. That's where my cosecant graph will have vertical asymptotes. 
And then we do that reciprocating business and we get that is one branch of the graph of cosecant and that's the other branch of the graph of cosecant. Now what some people will do, or they like to do, is they like to come in and erase the graph of the sine curve that was used as the guide. I, I think it's okay to leave that there. Just label your graphs. In other words, you know, just label, tell me that these two pieces together, that's called making a leader line, is the graph of y equals 2 cosecant 3x minus pi over 4. And that's it on how to graph this cosecant. So I hope you see that I'm using old stuff. I'm going to use the graph of how to graph the sine as my guide. Likewise, if I'm asked to graph y equals 2 secant 3x minus pi over 4, as soon as I see that it's a secant, boom, the first thing I would graph would be a cosine function. That's it. Hope it makes sense.